Welcome to EPG Patshala. I'm Professor Shushmita Basu Majumdar from the University of Calcutta, Department of Ancient Indian History and Culture. Today in the subject Indian Culture, paper Indian Epigraphy, we will be studying about literary inscriptions. As in the typological survey of inscriptions, you had seen that Richard Solomon has divided the contents of the inscriptions which have been found in the Indian subcontinent into 10 different categories. And these 10 categories are Royal, Donative and Panegyric which includes Ashokan inscriptions and Prashastis. Second is the Land Grant. Third, Private Donations. Fourth, memorial inscriptions, fifth, label inscriptions, sixth, pilgrims and travelers' records, seventh, cultic inscriptions, eighth, one is literary inscriptions, which we will be dealing now, then seals and uh, sealings, and miscellaneous inscriptions. So, today you will be learning with me literary inscriptions which have been found in the Indian subcontinent. This genre actually has very few inscriptions, but still it's quite significant. Among the literary inscriptions, we have dramas on stone and we also have a few poetries on stone. And it is very significant that such huge dramas were actually composed on the stones and we have not found their copies in manuscripts. So this inscription, particularly all the three inscriptions which actually have dramas have been found only on stones and we do not have any other copy of these. So this makes it very very significant and important. The three dramas are Harakeli Natak, Lalita Vigraharaj Natak and a Natika that is the Padijat Manjari Natika. The Lalita Vigraharaj Natak and Harakeli Natak have been found in the Arhai Dinka Jhopra mosque and so has the Parijat Manjari been found from the mosque that is a Kamal Mola mosque. So the Kamal Mola mosque is in Dhar in Madhya Pradesh which is very very important inscription which we will be dealing in detail. Other than that the Mahakavyas like Raja Prashasti Mahakavya of Ranachoda at Udaipur uh, is also considered as a literary inscription though it is in the form of a Mahakavya but the content primarily is eulogistic and dedicatory. We have already discussed that the literary inscriptions are one of the most important genres and very unique in character. The name itself reveals that the content is primarily literary but they are found engraved mainly on stones and walls of temples. Though limited in number, these are quite significant and unique. This category of inscriptions have brought forth dramas and poetries. Now let us discuss the dramas which have been found on stone. The Lalita Vigraharaj Natak is a very interesting drama but unfortunately all these dramas have been found in fragmentary conditions. So we do not know about the whole story of the drama but what is available shows that this was a drama of 10 episodes. Usually a Nataka is believed to have 10 or more episodes and a Natika that is a small form is supposed to have 4 episodes. So out of these 3 only Parijat Manjari is a Natika and Lalita Vigraharaj and Harakeli are mentioned as Natakas. So uh, this, Kama, this mosque Arhai Din Kajhopra is located on the lower slope of Taragar hill at Ajmer. The characters employed are Nagari of the 12th century CE. These inscriptions contain portions of two hitherto unknown plays, one of which is entitled Lalita Vigraharaj Natak, which was composed in honor of the king Vigraharaj Deva of Shakambari by Mahakavi Somadeva. Harakeli Natak, as the name suggests, is a drama regarding Shiva and Parvati. This drama was composed by Vigraharaja Deva himself. Three stones bearing the text of the drama have been found till now. 
these bear three acts of the nataka of these three two are incomplete and only fourth act has been found intact another stone bearing act 1 was also discovered later Keelhorn mentions the name of the princess as Desala Devi, who was the principal female character of the drama. On the basis of Act 3 and 4, the story of the play can be reconstructed. This is in the form of a prashasti of the Chahamana king Vigraharaja Deva, who has been also mentioned as Shakambarishwar. So he was the ruler of the Shakambari Vishaya. Now the third drama, that is the Parijat Manjari Natika, has been found from the Kamal Mola Mosque at Dhar. So here you can see this is the mosque and it is very interesting to note that all the plays have been discovered from mosques. Probably all these mosques were temple turned mosques and you can see the characters, they are beautifully engraved on the stone. Here you can see lines 1 to 26, this has been divided into three parts for your convenience and you can see how beautiful the characters are. This is also Nagari and the next lines are 26 to 54. This has been taken from Epigraphia Indica volume 8. And here you can see lines 55 to 82. So overall the inscription has 82 lines and this contains two basic uh, uh, acts of the play. So the inscription has two acts. The Dhar Prashasti of Arjunavarman is the same as the Parijat Manjari Natika because Madana, the composer of the Prashasti, calls it a Prashasti at the same time he also mentions it as a Natika. So this Natika is actually the Prashasti or the eulogy of the King Arjunavarman that is the reigning king who ruled in the early part of the 13th century CE. His other inscriptions are dated 1200 and 13, 14 and 15. So these are basically copper plates. The inscription under discussion is 5 feet and 8 inches by 5 feet. So it's a huge stone and Madan himself mentions that the inscription was engraved on two black stones. So out of these two we have only discovered one. So we are yet to discover the second stone which has the two other acts of the drama. So here let us discuss what is the Prashasti all about. Madan himself mentions that it is Shruti Lehiyam, that is it is to be tasted by the ears, so it's beautiful and sonorous. There are two varieties of Prakrit which has been used in this. One is Shorasheni which has been used for the prose and Maharashtri has been used for the verses. Now the text and the commentaries have been written by Firstly, it was edited by Hulz in Epigraphia Indica Volume 8 and later on Hulz again published it from Leipzig. A year later, a commentary of the Natika was published which was known as the Parimala Commentary by Sri Lakshman Suri. In 1953, Anantamaman Vakankar translated this text into Hindi. In 1963, S.K. Dikshit composed another commentary, namely Parimala Mod commentary. So this was actually worked upon only till the Parimal Amod commentary and after that scholars have not used this particular play for the reconstruction of history but it's a very very significant play. Let us now see what the inscription talks about. It begins with an introduction or invocation of Saraswati and she has been mentioned as Sharada Devi. So this particular mosque was once upon a time a temple of Sharada Devi and it mentions the Sharada Devi Sadmani. There is a possibility that this stone belonged to another temple and later on it was brought here when the mosque was actually built. So it also talks about a Sura Sadhana that is a place where the drama was performed and this particular drama is mentioned as a fresh play which was to be enacted on the day of the Saraswati Puja that is Vasanta Panchami. So Madan actually composed a fresh play for the audience and also his patron that is the king Arjunavarma. So the drama actually is set in a stage when Arjunavarman defeated 
Jayasingha, the Chahamana king, who was retreating, and later on Arjunavarman gets married to uh, Parijat Manchuri, who is actually the daughter of Jayasingha. This is the only reason why Parijat Manchuri has been mentioned as Jayasri, that is the daughter of Jayasingha, and also Vijayashri because she is the fruit of victory of the battle between Arjunavarman and Jayasingha. The other characters in the play are basically a Sutradhar, which you find in every uh, drama, the Nati who accompanies the Sutradhara, King Arjuna Varman himself, heroine that is Pajjat Manchuri, chief queen whose name is Sarvakala, Vidushaka who is named Vidagtha, Kanakalekha who is queen's attendant, royal gardener who is named Kusumakar and gardener's wife who is Vasantalila. The characters, uh, the particularly the female characters speak in Prakrit and the male characters, the elite male actually speak in Sanskrit. This is for first act Vasantotsava. Uh, we have already learned about the characters of this play and how the male characters speak in Sanskrit and particularly the elite male and how the female characters speak in Prakrit. But now let us learn a little about the act that is the two acts which we have found on the first stone as i have already mentioned that there are 82 lines and it consists of two acts the first act is named vasantotsava and the second act is called tadankadarpana the first act is named in Sanskrit, whereas the second act that is Tadankadarpan is actually a Prakrit appellation. This first act begins with a scene which is on the top of the royal palace, and the king who is actually coming back after a victory over the Chalukyan king Jayasingha celebrates this particular victory, and he it's mentioned that. Chalukya king Jayasinghe has died in the battle and the forces are now retreating and Arjuna Varman is celebrating his victory. So Madana mentions that a bunch of Parijat flowers fell on his chest and as soon as they touched his chest they turned into a beautiful lady and this lady is mentioned as Parijata Manchari that is the budding of the Parijat flowers and as soon as she turns into a lady, Arjuna Varman falls in love with the lady. And finally, they get married in the transit camp. It's mentioned as Yudhanta Shuddhanta uh, place. That is the place in which they had actually met. So this is a very significant thing that Arjuna Varman actually uh, had a consort who was Parijat Manchuri. But later on, he brought Parijat Manchuri back to his kingdom, that is, in his own kingdom at Dharanagari, and there he could not take her to the royal palace because already the chief queen, who was the princess of Kuntala, that is Sarvakala, was there in the palace. So he could not take Parijat Manchuri home and he decided to keep her at the Dharagiri hill. And here it is mentioned that at the Dharagiri hill, an emerald palace was constructed for keeping Parijat Manchuri. And to take care of Parijat Manchuri, Arjuna Varman calls Kusumakar, that is the royal gardener. Akara means mines and Kusuma is flower. So the royal gardener is named Kusumakar and he calls his wife Vasantalila and hands over Parijat Manjari to her. So Vasantalila and Parijat Manjari are residing in the Dharagiri palace and king returns to his royal palace. He forgets about Parijat Manjari and gets busy in his normal or day-to-day -day scores. And then there is a description of spring. So here comes the Vasantotsava. And when the spring arrives, the drama actually mentions about a raga, that is raga hindol. And the people on the streets are singing this raga and Arjuna Varman is in his palace. He is conversing with the queen, that is Sarvakala. 
and then Sarvakala mentions about a festival which is going to take place in the royal garden. So the uh, sh drama shifts from the royal palace to the royal garden. So the next act will actually be in the royal garden. So now we see that the king is being invited by Sarvakala to attend this festival that is uh, the festival of getting married, the mango tree with the Madhavi Lata. So the queen is mentioned as an expert in Riksha Yurveda, which is very interesting. She knows how to graft the trees. So she is getting her mango tree married to the Madhavilata. And the king now arrives in the royal garden and the royal garden becomes the place or the venue for the next uh, episode to take place. That is the Tadankadar. In the Tadanka Darpan, when the queen is actually performing the ritual, the king is not attending it with full attention because he sees the reflection of Parijat Manjari who is hiding behind the mango tree and as soon as Arjuna Varman looks at the reflection, he is reminded of Parijat Manjari and wants to go with her to the Dharagiri hill. And here the queen notices that the king is not attentive and then he, she actually retreats back to the royal palace as a mark of her anger and annoyance. The king goes after Parajat Manjari to the Dharagiri hill and immediately realizes that the queen is annoyed because she sends her attendant Kanakelekha with the earring on which the reflection had fallen, that is the Tadanka Darpan. So as soon as Kanakalekha hands over the earring, the king realizes that he has to retreat to the royal palace. And here ends act two. So we know that the two other acts, act three and four, would have been there on the other stone, which we have not discovered yet. So we have to still wait for another discovery from the Kamal Mola mask or somewhere else in Dhar to know more about the Parijat Manjari Natika. But we definitely know that it falls into the Vasantotsava genre. So definitely at the end, the king is going to get married to Parijat Manjari as happens in the other Natikas and Natakas of the Vasantotsava genre. So here we find in the second act that the queen is sending it back to the Dharagiri hill as a mark of her annoyance and here ends the second act. The, nat the Natika cannot actually end here because here the heroine is in a false position or rather she is not in a position where she can be called a heroine of this drama. So definitely the stone which had the second two other acts of this drama had the heroine as the major uh, role to play in the drama. So unfortunately we do not have that particular stone but this genre is the Vasantotsava genre. Now other than these Natakas and the Natikas we also find the uh, poems on stones. But before going on to the poems, let me discuss a little about the Shilpin Ramadeva who had actually engraved it. And he mentions his name in the first stone itself. This is very interesting because this uh, particular person that is Ramadeva, who is the son of Rupakara Sihaka, has uh, engraved it beautifully. And he mentions his name as if he knew that the next stone will be lost. But we are not much aware of uh, the fact whether the other stone was engraved by some other Shilpin or not. So it may be possible that two different artists were actually engraving two different stones at a time. Uh, now let us go to the genre of the poetries. There are very few poetries which are found engraved and mainly we have found at Dhar that is the same place where we have found the Parijat Manjari Natika 
टू ह्यूज पोएम्स रिकॉर्डेड ऑन स्टोन और एनग्रेव ऑन स्टोन द कैरेक्टर्स रिजेंबल द कैरेक्टर्स ऑफ दिस पर्टिकुलर नागरी कैरेक्टर्स ऑफ द प्लेस एंड हियर यू फाइंड दैट द कुर्म शतक आर एक्चुअली एनग्रेव these two are poetries and it's very significant because both the poetries are in prakrit so in the 13th century or even 12th century prakrit was very much in practice and people were writing uh, poetries in prakrit which is very very important the second significant fact about these poems are both of them have been attributed to king bhoja the paramara king bhoja though we do not know whether he really composed them or not but both of them have been attributed to him this was published in 1903 by pishel who did not give a translation of these so the kurma shatakas are composed in maharashtri prakrit the first kurma shataka uh, is known as the avani kurma shataka and it is mentioned as being composed by maharaja dhiraj bhoja dev these are very rare in, uh, examples of poetry on stone the other poems are also found inscribed at dhar like the khadga shataka kodanda kavya uh, both attributed to bhoj so it's very very interesting that they uh, actually attributed all the uh, dramas the sto- uh, the poetry is to bhoj the second kurma shataka actually praises bhoja himself and so we cannot really attribute it to the king himself you know he will not praise himself in the uh, poems so the way it has been done it actually gives a hint that it was composed by someone else but later we'll find that how it was composed by a person from south india in our discussion of the two shatakas mentioned above a peculiar character is that the authorship of both have been assigned to celebrated author bhoja as i have already mentioned and his date is 11th century ce bhoja shifted his capital from ujjain to dhara and it became a great center of learning as bhoja was a connoisseur of literatures even if the first shataka may be attributed to him the second that is the kurma shataka alone cannot be his composition both the shatakas begin with an invocation to shiva in the first shataka shiva is portrayed as lord of parvati pishal believe that the poems were dedicated to kurma or the tortoise incarnation of vishnu so he thought that the poems are actually the kurma avatar of vishnu's Uh, invocation but here we find that the adi kurma has been praised and this adi kurma is the one which supports the earth and the poetry is are actually praise of shiva and not of vishnu in the second one we find shiva's kankala murti has been praised and this kankala murti is a form which is more popular in the southern part of the subcontinent and not in the northern part of the subcontinent so it may be uh, uh, like surmised that the person who composed the second shataka which is the only kurma shataka and not avani kurma shataka was actually composed by a person hailing from southern part of the subcontinent shatakas basically mean a set of 100 shlokas but here we find that there are 109 shlokas in each poetry so definitely they did not form like follow the format of having only 100 but why the 109 the number 9 has been added to 100 is very uh, like insignificant we really do not know why this nine shlokas more have been added to each one of them now as far as the literary value is concerned there are not high of high order so they are very mediocre compositions and there are other poems inscribed on stone which are also attributed to bhoja which we have already discussed like the khadga shataka the kodanda kavya etc the poems could very well be the work of his court poets the language of these is basically maharashtri prakrit dhar actually had become a very very significant place of education and 
Many poets and literateurs had gathered in the court of Bhoja and that is the only reason we find most of the inscriptions in and around this region of Dhar. And this is indicated by a typical kind of an inscription which is found engraved on the walls of the Dhar temple and also a place nearby that is at Un. So in the Malava region only we find this kind of inscriptions which are popularly known as Sarpabandha inscription and the Sarpabandha inscriptions are also known by the name Varnanaga Kripanika. So here you can see these Varnanaga Kripanikas which were actually aids for learning grammatical rules. So these are basically grammatical sutras which are made in the form of snakes. So the students were actually made to learn by showing these small uh, presentations which were made on the temple walls. So this actually shows that this, cent this center at Dhara and Atun had become very very significant for learning grammar, for learning literature and the poets actually wanted their, uh, their compositions to become immortal and that's the only reason why they had taken the decision of engraving them on stone because engraving on stone is very difficult and particularly engraving such large dramas, large poetries is very very difficult. So this is a kind of a tradition which started only in Central India. Now what we find very significant is that there are very few examples of such literary inscriptions but every literary inscription which we find is very very important. And finally for understanding the culture of the region these prove a very significant uh, source material. So when we look at the uh, dramas which were performed in the contemporary times we really understand what was the contemporary culture and what kind of people actually came to see the drama and witness it. So what kind of language actually did they understand. So the elite in those days definitely had a good understanding of Sanskrit as well as different form of Prakrits. And finally to summarize what we have mentioned in this literary inscription genre, I would repeat again that we have discussed dramas, we have discussed poetries and one of the earliest poetries which has been mentioned by scholars is actually the Sita Benga inscription which, we, which they had mentioned that it's a two-line love poetry. But recent researchers have shown that the Sita Benga inscription is not a poetry at all. So we have excluded the Sita Benga inscription from this genre of poetry and we have only kept the dramas, the three major dramas and also the different poetries which have been found on stone. So this actually comprises the literary genre. Thank you for attending the EPG Patshala with me, Prof. Shushmita Basuma Jamdar. And do visit EPG Patshala to learn more about inscriptions.